Hello, I'm Marianne Borer from Hims, and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for taking time to be here today. We have an exciting program for you, but before we get started, I'd like to highlight a few things so you know how to participate in today's event. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. All those engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. Now, if you need technical assistance during today's event, click the question mark icon in the navigation menu at the bottom of your screen. You'll find answers to frequently asked questions, or you can type your questions in the Q&A widget to the right of the media player. You can use that same box to submit questions to the speakers at any time. And if we don't get to your questions today, we'll follow up with you offline. And you can engage with today's content and let us know how you're feeling with the emoji reactions. If you miss anything, don't worry. You will receive an email within 24 hours with a link to the on-demand recording when it becomes available. So now, let's get started with today's program, Building on Success, How Baptist Health is Taking an Enterprise Approach to Care at Home, sponsored by Current Health, a Best Buy Health Company. Our speakers today are Dr. Brett Oliver, CMIO at Baptist Health, Kentucky and Indiana, Evan Harmon, Remote Patient Monitoring System Leader at Baptist Health, Kentucky and Indiana, Dr. Adam Wolfberg, CMO at Current Health. Now with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Wolfberg to begin the presentation. Thank you so much. We are really excited to be here with you today. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be presenting this with uh, Brad and Evan. Um, I hope you find it as interesting as, as we have found it to put together this presentation for you today. So let me briefly go over the agenda and then we'll get right into it. The first topic is defining an enterprise approach to care at home. And my, my colleagues here from Baptist are uh, leading a care at home um, set of programs from one of the most sophisticated health systems uh, in the country and taking that sort of broad enterprise approach that allows for scale is something that I think that they've really nailed. And so we're going to hear from them about what that means. We're also going to hear from them about where to start, uh, because you do have to start someplace and, and they have tremendous experience uh, with um, making those decisions and then um, leading to the third topic of the agenda today, which is how do you scale? How do you go from that initial program to that broad enterprise approach? So uh, with that in mind, um, let's start first with a video that shows a little bit of uh, the impact that a successful care at home program can make on the people that matter most, and um, those are the patients. I've been healthy all my life. I ran the mini marathons, rode bikes, played in the pool, used to walk 15 miles a day, and then all of a sudden they tell me I've got heart problems. Several years with shortness of air, thinking it was lung related, went into the hospital. They did more tests, cardiac and all that, putting on different medicines, sent me home with the health monitoring system. It's been really good. I was really scared at first. Being a nurse, I know what heart problems are, and I was scared to death because with heart issues, you don't know what your heart's doing unless you're on something that helps you monitor it. I've got three granddaughters, and I watched them a lot before I got sick. After I got sick, of course, I was really weak. I couldn't watch them, and it affected me as well as they did them. Having the current health to where working alongside with the Baptist Heart Clinic made me feel less frightened and like more people were watching over me and making sure I was okay. I had some good support from the current health technology, knowing that the nurses were watching me and were going to call me if anything was wrong. You don't want to gain weight with congestive heart failure because it's hard to have to work harder. When my weight went up, sure enough, they called me and told me that I was two pounds over. I explained to them that I had eaten out the day before and had more salt than I normally intake. Having the monitoring made me be honest. It has put me in the routine. I get up in the mornings, I weigh myself, I take my blood pressure, take my pulse every day and watch my O2 sats. I also have my watch that I will keep an eye on my heart rate during the day. 
It's nice to have the security of knowing that I was being monitored. It really does help the doctors and the nurses do the best thing for your situation and keep you healthy. I was afraid if I did more than I was supposed to, that I was going to throw my heart into a funky rhythm. And now I'm happy to say my ejection fraction has come up significantly. I can do stuff with my husband. We can go out on the boat. We can go camping and I don't have to worry as much as I would have before. It's nice to have my strength back to where I can do things with my baby girls. Now I'm starting to watch them again and it's wonderful. I know I'm getting older, but I still like using the pool and they get in the pool with me. We play out on the play set, which is out in the yard. This is just like their home. And it's just nice knowing that I'm going to be around a lot longer so that they'll remember me. I never see that video without uh, being moved. So let's get into it. Um, the first topic of the agenda is defining the uh, enterprise approach to a care at home program. And um, who better to hear that from than the leader who has spearheaded uh, that work at Baptist. So Dr. Brett Oliver, Brett, do you wanna tell us a bit about that? Sure. You know, when we were going about finding um, a monitoring solution, like a lot of different solutions, we're limited in our resources in IT. And I want something that I can utilize in multiple different clinical scenarios. I think one of the challenges in IT is getting our clinical and operational partners to come to us with the problems that they have rather than a, a technical solution. When, when you let them come with a technical solution, um, you're going to end up with multiple solutions. And, and that is very hard to maintain as from a financial standpoint, as well as just a, a technical standpoint. So we are a nine hospital system spread across the state of Kentucky and Southern Indiana, 2,300 beds, 1.7 million outpatient visits last year. Importantly, 257,000 home care visits and 153,000 virtual visits. So we, we're spread across in rural areas and urban areas, and we're gonna have different needs as we, as we move forward, whether that's in AI, in home care, what have you. And so it's really important for us to make sure that we're thinking of the entire enterprise when we do that. And that's different for us. We, we grew up a federation of, of different facilities that were under one umbrella, and you run into a lot of problems with that. You run into multiple solutions for the same problem, uh, you run into competing priorities and things like that. And, and we deal with the same challenges that a lot of you on this webinar are, are, are dealing with, you know, burnout of our providers. We've got some areas in our state, uh, in both states of Southern Indiana and, and Kentucky, where connect, uh, connectivity, we don't even have uh, cell service. And so taking that into consideration when you're developing an approach, um, we certainly have co uh, competition, both traditional players in our markets as well as non-traditional players. And then like everybody, particularly the last six months, been challenged with the finances driven by labor market and, and COVID. Um, so when we went about this, we were looking for something that we could um, plug and play the clinical scenarios uh, that would arise. So for instance, we started off with a pilot of COPD and CHF uh, readmission avoidance. Um, that was in January of 2020. And so by March of 2020, when COVID hit, we had to pivot quickly. If we had to go out and find another product to help us monitor COVID patients at different facilities or from home or from a college dorm or hotel room or wherever our surge planning might take us, we, we, would, we wouldn't be able to pivot like we did. We really pivoted over a, a couple of weeks from what we were doing in those two disease states to taking care of COVID patients with at-home monitoring. And it's, you can only do that when you've got an enterprise solution where you're plugging and playing the different um, uh, clinical scenarios that are needed. Um, but along with that enterprise solution, you also address some of these challenges. Um, if you've got one product that's integrated into your EHR, then it doesn't matter what the clinical scenario is. The burnout uh, is lessened on a provider because they're more efficient. They don't have to learn a new system. Um, and then certainly it's a lot less expensive to have one uh, um, 
solution rather than multiple solutions across. But I guess I'll stop there. Evan, anything to add? I think you covered it really, really well. I, I don't think there's anything additionally that I would add to that. Brett, when you think about the technology that's required to enable a enterprise level program, you know, what are the characteristics that you're looking for? You know, you've mentioned some of these, but but um, what else comes to mind? I think that interoperability piece is big. You know, we when we first started our uh, relationship with Current Health, we did it as a pilot. We unfortunately had to pivot to COVID, and we did not have that interoperability. Our providers that were caring for patients using the tool had to go to a different dashboard. That was never our intention, but that was just the first iteration of how we had to get there because it's really important to understand the burden on the on the end user, the nurse, the, the physician. I'm telling you, one extra click out of their normal workflow and it just won't happen. Your, your adoption will be so much less than if it can be in their normal workflow and become part of it. It's, I have a number of conversations with vendors throughout the year and looking at new products, new ideas. And, and they sometimes it's really hard to understand that, um, that, but it's just two clicks and it'll open up this dashboard, Brett. And it, it's really easy. And like you, you lost me at two more clicks, open up another dashboard. And so it's that interoperability piece, the ability for this platform that you choose to get put into the normal workflow of a provider of a caregiver is, is essential. I think you can do it without it. You're just going to have a provider experience, which is also on here, that's going to be less than less than optimal. Um, adoption is incredibly important. We can't force this from an IPT perspective. Yeah, I'm a clinician, but I can't force this on anybody. And I think if it's not easy and it doesn't get other clinicians excited about it, you'll be limited in, in your ability to do that. Great, that's exactly great points. Thanks. And, and sorry, Evan, I, I was just going to say, you know, do, do you want to do you want to talk about beyond technology? What 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 else is important here? I mean, you've got incredible yeah. experience across your organization um, building out these programs. You know, what comes to mind? Yeah, it really is. It's setting those foundational elements, as as Dr. Oliver mentioned. So making sure that there is strong operational process, that there's staff to be able to support the technology. You can have the best technology in the world, but if you don't have your operational process shored up, you don't have staffing levels that make sense, then you're going to have trouble, you know, getting your program off the ground uh, successfully, and you're going to have some significant challenges in scaling it. So we've done a lot of work in that foundational piece. And as part of building those foundations, going back to what Dr. Oliver mentioned regarding the interface, that was really quite an important element, you know, having that available before we start really scaling to other areas, making sure that those tools are shored up, really an important element as we move, as we move and as we grow in this space. I think it's also important to add that one thing that Evan and I have discovered is sometimes folks will come to you saying, oh, wow, I didn't know we had this available to us. We want to use it for blank. And the first question to ask, in my opinion, is what are you doing right now with that? Because a lot of times they're looking for that technical tool to create an operational system. And it's really better to have that operational process in place, at least to some extent, and then apply the tool. That's to right. That's right. Evan, do you mind talking us through sort of how you put all these pieces together? That's right. <clears throat> yep. Happy to do that. So it is this slide really outlines very well what we're what we're thinking about. We're thinking about bringing the right folks together. We're thinking about hearing what the needs are. So we have an RPM intake process that we have, uh, a form that we ask our group to fill out when they have an idea about something, but it always starts with a conversation, uh, getting some high level discussion and having a physician champion or having a uh, set of operational leaders in that space that are really excited and bringing those stakeholders together for an initial idea discussion and then saying, okay, we know what you want to do. Now let's see if um, RPM fits this use case. So then providing them the intake form and getting those additional details, understanding what their operational process is and how they intend to use the technology, understanding what uh, technology options that they want to integrate in. So one of the big benefits of current health is that you all offer a lot of opportunities within your toolkit 
a lot of different peripheral devices that can be used for various different clinical use cases. So that's where we're gathering those requirements. And then looking at some of those timelines, understanding what is feasible within the scope of our IT team to build these items out and what is feasible from that operational perspective. And I'll let Dr. Oliver talk a little bit to the, the timeline piece and the, and, and the let it cook piece because that's been something that we've had to really think about and be patient with as we scale our program. Yeah, I would just add the let it cook piece. It's not necessarily totally passive, but again, as a clinician, you want to get this tool in as many hands of as many patients as you can because you know the, the, the advantages of it. However, I'm in the IT department at our organization and I cannot drive this myself. I have to have those operational partners, those physician champions, and you don't create those overnight in my opinion. And so you, you get the solution out there and COVID allowed us to really get the, the idea out there much faster than, than perhaps we would have uh, normally. But it's only scalable when other people understand what's available. They understand that you've got an enterprise approach. It's not a one trick pony. I can apply the CHF monitoring in a different sense, in a different uh, clinical scenario. And I think that's really important. But from an IT perspective, throw it out there. Continue to remind people what's available. Start If you get some data uh, created from another clinic that's out there, share that. And it gets those creative juices going. And then when they have the opportunity, the time, uh, they'll come forward. And I think we're, we're, at, we're past that tipping point where we've got some internal data that's impressive particularly in our heart failure clinic. And now all of our facilities are interested in, in uh, running uh, remote patient monitoring from their heart failure clinics um, where it was harder to even get in the door initially. Like everybody's busy. I don't need anything else on my plate. But you, you start creating that internal data, that cooking, that the stove gets a little hotter and it's easier you know, to get uh, buy in and find those champions that will, will do that for you. Yeah, that's exactly right. And sometimes that requires somebody like me and Dr. Oliver who know how to cool this tool is to set, like, have to be a little bit patient, you know, but let that fire catch, you know, but once it gets caught and, and that fire's rolling, then you're going to have a lot of people knocking on your door asking you about using the tools. And that's been really an exciting thing and, and being able to pull that data to, to show the impact that it's making that, that throws fuel on the fire to get people uh, excited about the tools that you have and how it's making a strong impact in your patient population. Yeah, I'd like to go back and just add on that intake process that Evan mentioned, don't be afraid for that to be a detailed questionnaire, not just a, I wanna monitor this, what do you have for me? You know, asking about those workflows. We, we ran into an issue with our, our first heart failure clinic of I mean, I don't, Evan, I can't remember if we were a week or two from going live, the initial go live date. And someone asked the question, well, where does the alarm go after hours? Who's taking care of that? Yeah. And, you know, you got a lot of, well, not me, uh, you know, the kind of responses. And uh, so we actually ended up having to back off on the go live date at that point until we had that mm -hmm. sorted through huge gap. And, and so obviously we learned from that and added that to our to our intake process, but don't be afraid to make that uh, a bit onerous uh, to get all those details up front to make the process uh, of implementing smoother. So, you know, we're going to come back in a minute and talk about where to start, but this topic of uh, dotting all the I's, crossing all the T's, not pushing too fast is a uh, it's a really important one, um, obviously, in terms of setting up a program for success. But I think it also represents a challenge, particularly for those of us. And, and I know that the three of us are in this group who want to move things forward fast. So, you know, talk a little bit about when you're thinking about accelerating, when you're thinking about getting ready to do the next thing, add the next patient. What, what do you think about it? What are the sort of tricks to um, successful acceleration. Evan, do you want to, I mean, I know you've thought a lot about this. What do you yeah. think? So definitely the foundation is, is huge. You know, you don't, you don't build a house on sand and, and you need a strong foundation. And, and that, is, that is very, very much important. And taking the lesson learns from each of those 
initial pilots is so vitally important. Coming back to that group, asking questions, okay, how is this working for you? And retooling uh, as needed. So it's sort of been an iterative optimization process as we scale, for example, our heart failure clinic. So we started in our in one of our markets and saw great success there, but have had to come back a couple of different times and say, how do we change or improve processes before we go to the next market? And that's just setting that next market up for success. We're moving through those uh, challenges. We're moving through the lessons learned. So as you are doing that, you're going to want to make sure to put those those proper uh, stop gaps in place to do that before you move to the next one. But when you get your foundation developed and you've worked through some of those challenges, what's so nice about your ability to scale is you've you've hit those challenges, you've built the tools to correct them, and then you just roll those tools out to the next market. But one of the big things that we really take a lot of pride in here at Baptist is trying to standardize as much as we can and have everybody doing the same or similar workflows. And with that in mind, we made sure that we created tools that were going to be flexible enough uh, with our RPM program and our clinic rollouts in particular to work across service lines. So when you're developing your tools and you're developing, for instance, a remote patient monitoring documentation navigator in your EHR system, you're going to want to make sure that you develop those tools in a standardized fashion that follow billing considerations, that follow documentation requirements that you're going to be required to report on. And then as you roll from one service line, our cardiology service line, to maybe a, a new service line, maybe you want to do a COPD use case. So rolling in with that case is uh, using the same or similar tools, but then just adjusting the peripheral devices or the other items that you're adding in, the other tools that you're adding in. It's just as simple as that and using some of your standard tools that will work for everyone. Yeah, I would just add, you know, if, if you are an organization that have multiple hospitals, you're going to have some clinicians that go to multiple hospital sites uh, to administer care. And if you've got point solutions at each of those facilities, imagine trying to learn a different process for heart failure at three different places, workflows, tools, all of that. So, you know, to establish that, and I, I really don't see like that it's an option. I know it seems like, wow, you know, you guys decided on an enterprise approach, but like, what is your option to have multiple point care solutions? You, you won't, you won't be able to afford it. You won't be able to operationalize it. Um, and, and again, I think that goes with a lot of different scenarios in medicine, particularly as technology advances and we've got more opportunities for that. But I just wanted to, you know, from the clinician standpoint, I think of it when I, uh, I was, I helped a friend who rolled out an Epic go live in another part of the country recently. And to see their clinicians that went from four or five different EMRs to one, and they were delivering care in, four, in where they were required to understand workflows in four or five EMRs, you know, you talk about a burden reduction on an end user is, is amazing. It's a really important point, Brett. So uh, I want to sort of step back and talk a little bit um, about where to start, um, and not surprisingly that the the um, the condition heart failure has come up uh, repeatedly in this discussion and frequently represents uh, a good place to start for a care at home program. It's a condition that uh, impacts one to two percent of Americans, uh, enormous burden on uh, our patients and their loved ones on our health systems. So, Brett, do you want to start there and talk a little bit about um, how Baptist chose CHF as a diagnosis to start with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you nailed it. Uh, credibly, unfortunately, credibly common condition. It's also a condition that has some data historically to back up uh, algorithm use at home. You know, we've had those before where we're like, okay, I want you to weigh yourself every day. And if you gain more than three pounds in 48 hours, take an additional dose of Lasix. Like we've had that procedural process for a couple of decades now. So it was a natural fit. Um, but even probably more than that for us, we had a clinician that, that understood the power that this could have and really bought in early. And, and that was key. Like we could still have done it, but to have uh, Dr. Stephen Heatherly kind of lead this effort from a medical director standpoint has been fantastic. So our data showed that you know, we're talking the highest risk heart failure patients that we have in this program 
that the average 30 day readmission rate was 22 to 23 percent historically in our organization. So obviously a huge opportunity is another reason to take that on. Um, 11.4 percent of our Medicare population has heart failure. And heart failure was one of our strategic initiatives uh, to improve that care in our organization. So it made it really not easy. It's been a lot of work, but it made it real obvious, I guess, to, to start there. Um, and, you know, we've gone through the whole gamut of the continuous monitoring. We started without an integration into our EHR. We've integrated into our EHR, which is epic. Um, getting the data to flow into, into flow sheets is, is, has been a tremendous improvement. Um, still working on the billing interface piece, but we're getting closer every day. Incredibly complex and not necessarily a current or epic issue, but a government in terms of how we have to document to get, to get paid. Um, but I, I'd like to go, I'd just share that, you know, we've been live in the Louisville clinic, uh, one of our larger clinics now since last December. And while I know this won't last at this today's date, we still have not had a readmission for heart failure. So you're talking about, we should have expected 22 or 23%. And, you know, over the last eight or nine months, we've had zero, uh, is, it's a little bit hard to believe, you know, and, and you realize that, Yes, the device is important, and that's what we're here talking about. But what's also important are all these touch points and educational pieces that the patient gets because they're in the program, because of the monitoring device. Um, what's interesting is we've had you know a variation in, in adoption of the monitoring, meaning you know sometimes it may be sixty percent of the time the patient's wearing it, sometimes it's eighty-five percent. But there's been no devi deviation from this no readmissions. So there's more to it than just the monitoring piece. It's this whole program and, and these touch points. And I think that's what gets me excited is this is just like the first step of how we start begin to deliver care from home. Um, you know, overall, and I'm not even talking about a full hospital at home, but just more touch points. It used to be I see you in the office. I give you some advice. I prescribe a medicine and then you're on your own until I see you again. Um, that, that's, that's changing with this kind of program. And it's exciting to see. Our medical director said he's never seen an intervention in heart failure in his career that's had this much impact. I, I, that's just you know a phenomenal statement from a clinical leader that doesn't have a stake in the IT part at all, uh, and is you know raring to go to get this rolled out to to our other markets. That's got to be incredibly gratifying to hear. Um, and congratulations! Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's obviously not happened by accident. I I know that your organization has put together a very careful patient journey. And so, um, Evan, you want to talk about that? I, I mean, this is this well, has been I, a, a real marquee success. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so there a lot of thought went into how we roll patients into our program. So their patient journey for getting remote patient monitoring technology typically follows an ED hospitalization or a referral through our heart failure clinic or our specialty clinic. And this will be transferable as we look heart failure COPD. So we're using the heart failure use case, but know that this is how this will work for the bulk of our specialty clinics as we look to scale COPD clinic. So they're referred typically to the clinic. And then once they get that referral into the heart failure clinic, the heart failure clinic is going to do a very detailed chart review. They're going to look at some, some particular items for inclusion that are that do require sometimes a more detailed look into the chart. It isn't just, I can't just create a quick BPA or something, a best practice advisory to, to, to do some of the detailed looking that they're doing. And maybe one day we'll have something like that, but, but at this juncture, we don't. Uh, so they do do a deep dive into that patient and say, is this patient going to be a good fit? And they'll, they'll reach out to that patient and, and make sure that that patient understands what the program looks like and, and is able to consent to it. And they, at that point, that enrollment occurs. And one of the things that's really special about our heart failure clinic is they do roll the devices direct from the clinic. So the patient, when they're doing the education, they're taking things out of the box. They're talking to the patient about how the equipment works and what, you know, what, what to expect once they get home. So I think that's really, really helpful because it allows the patient to ask questions in clinic. And then they'll carry out that enrollment. The patient does their self-management. And, and through the course of that self-management, you, you know, alerts are firing, you're calling the patient, you're doing the necessary things that you need to do uh, to, to help them be healthier at home and to, to form those good habits. And then after that three to six months of positive trends, looking to start doing that discharge process. 
Um, but there is the daily monitoring of vitals, that regular engagement that's occurring within that three to six month period. I think, Evan, you said one of the really important parts, you know, that element of, of interaction with a staff member. You know, we've done it a bunch of different ways. With COVID, we have, con have considered sending it to the patient. It's a very easy setup. I mean, it, it walks you through it. But that scripting that you can have from a nurse or a clinician at the time that they're getting the device, I think, is really important. Before COVID, when we had our initial pilot, we ran into some adoption issues. And when we kind of peeled back the layers of the onion, really what we figured out was the nurses didn't understand that we're actually giving the devices that didn't un understand fully why we were doing it. And so, you know, the script would, they would say something like, well, here's this thing. If you want to take it home and wear it or something, people will watch it. And it just really, no, I just want to go home. I don't, I don't want to participate versus, you know, you're going home now because we're going to monitor you with this device. That's the only reason you're able to go home sooner than, than we normally expect. And so this is part of your care plan. This is super important. You know, like that kind of change really made a difference in, in patient adoption. And I think it's, again, it's that human touch. It is, yeah, the technology is great, but making sure you've got the right people delivering it. And, you know, our heart failure clinic folks are just outstanding. And so to hear what Evan had to say, I, I think that's really important. So helpful. So um, you know, we're going to wrap up here in a minute and take some questions, but I, I thought I'd just take a second to summarize a little bit and make some observations from uh, what you, uh, Evan, and you, Brett, have said about your you know, rather extraordinary success um, in, in the Baptist system. Um, you know, the first is, is that, that you have to get the fundamentals Right. Um, you put technology, you put services, you put a project plan in place, um, but you have to get buy in and you have to find the right champions, the right stakeholders, make sure that they're really part of the team and then test it. And then I'll give it a little bit of space to grow, to grow on its own, to take root, uh, to demonstrate local success before you aim for scale. Um, and that, that's something you've done incredibly successfully. The other thing I heard was uh, the importance of um, buy-in and engagement as a program scales. Uh, you know, a, a minute ago, Brett, you talked about the importance of getting the, the clinical team bought in so that they not only communicate to their patients, but genuinely believe that the program you're rolling out in the home uh, is going to allow those patients to successfully transition from uh, facility to the home environment. And that's the key piece, right? That the patient was in a facility, whether it's in a clinic or whether it's in a hospital bed, um, they were under direct observation and they are moving to a home environment where they are going to be largely independent. And so um, we are, I think, working together to, to teach them how to move healthcare into the home. And patient engagement is, of course, critical, uh, as is the um, buy-in, support, enthusiasm, uh, and engagement of the care providers who are doing their job in a slightly new environment. The, the last, I was sorry, Brett. Add, the, yeah, the, please. Like with COVID, we found a lot of patients, just the secure, like someone who lived alone, the security of knowing that someone was keeping an eye on, particularly early on in the pandemic when so much was unknown and COVID patients tended to deteriorate rapidly, even after, you know, a lengthy time with the illness, um, knowing that, Hey, I can go home safely, particularly when you, you know, bed, uh, numbers were were in crunch. Um, that was a that was a big deal. I even had one of my own patients that after about six weeks we went to collect the device and she was like, "Whoa, uh, could I keep it a little longer?" <laughs> you know, um, she didn't really have the clinical need to, but we let her because she she lived by herself and it was that that comfort level. And I think that engagement with patients pays off in in other ways that maybe not as um, obvious out, out of the box. Yeah, it's a great point, and and I would just sort of emphasize what went into that patient's request, which is I, I'm going to imagine that you, your team, 
taught her about the program you were implementing for her in the home showed her the value and made it her own, which is really powerful. So it's really powerful. Mm-hmm. You know, lastly, I would just um, point out the, the, the complexity of deploying a clinical program in the home. Um, because you not only have to manage the patient, but you have to get technology out there. Uh, you have to make sure that it works. You have to replace consumables as they are consumed. Uh, you may have to bring additional services to bear. And at the end of the program, um, you need to discharge the patient and retrieve all of this and transition the patient into the next phase of their care, presumably uh, in a lower acuity context. So. You know what I've. You haven't sort of talked about the nuts and bolts of success when it comes to these uh, logistics and services issue, but uh, I, I know that without your uh, elegant approach to to those topics um, and those challenges, this program, these programs would not have been um, as successful. So you know, just keeping that in mind uh, is going to be important for anyone who plans to scale a enterprise level uh, care at home program. That's right. Yeah, we could probably spend a whole session just talking about the logistics and, you know, there's still, we're still learning lessons in that space about how to, to do that in a way that makes sense. And, and as you scale, you may want to partner with a vendor that can help you with those logistics. But that's, a, that's probably another chat <laughs> from longer, uh, that, would, that would be a bit longer. Yeah, but, I, one, right. but one example, when we were rolling out the devices to monitor COVID patients from home, clearly all our facilities had COVID patients. And just the simple question of where are we going to store the devices? You don't want them out in the open, right? Like so what closet, what office, who's going to be responsible? Like just that one question alone, logistically, um, took several meetings and, and cha- actually changed our approach to how we were going to deliver the device. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's uh, like so many things, um, it's complex. And also like so many things with proper planning and proper leadership, uh, it's, um, it, it can be accomplished and accomplished well. So uh, with that, let's um, wrap up with the presentation. And I think we've got a few minutes for some questions. We had a couple questions come in and um, let me put these to uh, you, Brett, and to you, uh, Evan. Um, first question, um, Evan, why don't you start? What excites you most about the future of Care at Home? I think the most exciting thing about it is really just having that patient be in a space where they're most comfortable. I think there's a lot of literature about there and there's still a lot of studies that need to be done about how someone can improve much better when they are in the space at home in a place that they're fully comfortable, you know, I just think that is one of the coolest things about all of this. Now, we're not going to be always able to do every condition every time at home, but certainly when it makes sense to do that. I think it's a huge patient satisfier, and I think it really it really shows on that experience, that whole patient experience level that is really going to really take care forward. And then have, being able to use tools like what we have, it's, it's just very fascinating to be able to study all of that and see how it has improved the patient's care outcome. Thank you. Brett, a uh, different question for you. Um, these are challenging times for healthcare providers. Um, there are a lot of sick patients. There are um, provider shortages across specialties, across nursing. And yet we're rolling out new programs. And when we've gone in, in some depth about the challenges involved in being successful here, what are the strategies that you found most successful in terms of developing provider enthusiasm, generating engagement, you know, really sort of getting your team on board to make a novel program uh, successful? I think you first have to say, what am I adding or what am I taking away from that provider, that nurse? Um, hopefully it's, it's, I'm taking something away. I'm making them more efficient. 
if you're going to add to their workflow, you're not going to be, it, it may be the best device, the best process, the best program in the world. But if you're going to add to their already overburdened workflow, I think you're going to struggle. You're certainly going to struggle with engagement. Beyond that, I think the biggest thing for my colleagues is the data. When you can show them the data and what this can do for their patients, most of us want to do the best thing for our patient. Like that's why we went into this. Um, and so, you know, for us to get that kind of heart failure data back has just, you know, brought enthusiasm and, and, and provider engagement like we hadn't seen so far in our program. It reminds me a little bit of, of when COVID started in the first few months. There was a esprit de corps of, about the provider. So as tired and, and burned out as folks were prior to COVID, COVID hits and you're like, oh, this is going to be terrible. People are going to be down in the dumps. They're going to be burning out further. We actually saw the opposite because there was this unified, wow, we've got to pull together to get through this. And in some regards, the analogy will hold. And when you've got a heart failure clinic that is doing so well, adding this program, I want my heart failure clinic to do that well. Let me, and it, and it gives you that energy. Um, so data, not adding to their, their already burdened administrative tasks. And then that integration piece is, is key. They can't have to go somewhere else. Again, that's an additional step. I guess that goes to my first point, but I think those are the two, uh, three most important things. Uh, and then seeing the patient's response to that as well. Thanks, Brett. Evan, um, last question for you. What are the factors that, that for you make a difference when it comes to um, patient engagement and patient success in these programs? What have you seen um, make the difference in um, Baptist success? Definitely starting the patient out on the right foot with good education. Our clinicians and folks that are in our clinics and, and our home care folks, they really have taken that initial education point serious with the patient. And then if maybe they didn't come across to the patient fully the way that they needed to, that re-engagement. So we're fortunate enough in that the technology does alert us when the patient isn't wearing the device or maybe they have a low battery and seeing those technical alarms fire prompts us then that the patient does need a, a little nudge, a little bit of re-engagement and calling that patient and saying, hey, we see you're not wearing the device today or we see you haven't charged it. You know, Are there training gaps there that we need to address and how to charge it or, or what's the reason that you're not wearing it and really talking that through with the patient. Also, another thing that's been very helpful to us is using a nurse call center through Current Health while we work to scale our own uh, group to be, to be able to do those types of, of calls and having the technical arm of current health do those engagement nudges for us and help us with those engagement nudges such that our care providers can focus on the clinical things and, and operate at top of clinical license has been quite helpful to us as well. Evan, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up there and, and um, Marianne, I'll turn it back to you. But first, I just want to personally thank you, Evan, uh, you, Dr. Oliver, um, for uh, participating in this discussion, and congratulations uh, on your success with your care at home programs. And, and um, I, I know, you know, as a clinician, that the impact you've had on your patients is um, nothing short of remarkable. Uh, so thank you. Marianne, back to you. Thank you very much. At this time, we do have to wrap up. And thanks again, Dr. Oliver, Dr. Wolfberg, and Evan for a wonderful presentation. Once again, we want to thank our sponsor, Current Health, for their support of this webinar. Now, don't forget to take our brief evaluation at the conclusion of today's event and share your thoughts with us. And as a reminder, you'll receive an email within 24 hours to re-watch the on-demand recording of today's session, and it will be available in the HIMSS Resource Hub for a limited time, so feel free to come back and watch at any time. Thanks, everyone, and have a terrific rest of your day.